welcome to We Can Walk About in our gardens and years virtually. We're talking about dividing perennials today and we're moving into chapter two, which is we're actually going to be making the cuts on these plants. She's Janet McConovich. I'm Stephen Nicola. We're garden a to Z .org. And I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty keeping our garage studio and our, our screen going together here. But we're working off of this outline, which you can outline, uh, download from our website um, at, uh, in our, on our webinar audience notes page. We're going right now to go out with some nice sharp instruments of various kinds and some plants that we've dug up for you out into our garage studio. This Here's is what it looks like right now, at. except that I've now emptied all those buckets that are off to the side. Yeah. And uh, we're going to divide for you. What we want you to do is, is keep in mind that this is where we are in the outline. We're showing you growing eyes or sections that can be divided about why you might want to discard the centers of plants and some of the uh, slicing to divide. We'll show you how it goes so we're not just showing you the finished product, but how it actually happens. Um, we'll come back and do a recap, but that's what we'd like you to pay attention to. These are the live samples that we have. Um, if you would take a look at those, what we're going to be doing when once we move this here to, uh, to showing our table behind me and the real plants, is if you see a plant on that list that you would like to see divided, in case we can't get to all of them, please chat that you'd like to see that plant so that our co-hosts, our daughter, Sonia Nicola, can tell us, okay, now we need to do bleeding heart, or now we need to do Gillardia, or now we need to do hellebore. Uh, we have other plants we can show you afterwards in pictures, but these are the real plants that we have right now. I'm going to uh, be working with things like uh, hand pruners are always very good to have, something you can clip with. Um, you may want to use a saw. Someplace around here, someplace probably buried in the tools I've been shifting around to make room in the garage to make it a studio, I have a root saw, but a saw is helpful for things that have woody roots or the really tight crowns, a knife, and I use uh, this one that Steve calls my Rambo knife, but maybe even better than a Rambo type knife is a carpet knife, one with a hook on it. Mine is also somewhere around here. We were scurrying quite a bit yesterday and things got moved. Um, I've even used this morning a hammer and chisel on the woody ones. I'll tell you about that a little bit later, but I'm gonna set those way to the side because that's extreme. Um, I'm gonna start with the runners. So we have runners such as um, foam flower. Foam flower grows like uh, strawberries do. Mother plant, pretty little plant with uh, variegated leaves where the center leaf veins are dark red. Uh, one of our native plants that I like a lot in the shade and is a good ground cover in the shade, not quite as fast as the geraniums that I was telling you about earlier. But as it grows, it, it's a modified uh, stem, a stolen, that lays out to the side here. And as soon as it gets out beyond the shade of the mother plant, it begins to root and grow a new plant, which becomes a new plant. This actually is a runner. This is one of the plants that grew off of this bigger plant. And any piece of this can grow. So any piece that I want to use and plant out by itself, I can cut away from the mother plant. There are roots on the bottom already started. So even this little tiny piece can be planted and would grow um, further out from the mother plant and more into the sun, there's more roots so that can grow all by itself. So I can make, oh, probably, I'm gonna say conservatively, I can make 100 plants out of this foam flower that's right here. Um, I can also divide the original plant might be easier to see on this one right here. The original plant is also making little offsets of itself. So I can divide right from the original plant and pull out from there. So right in the center of the plant, if I pull aside, there is a cluster of, let's see, what's a good pointer? There's a cluster of stems here and a cluster of stems there and simply by cutting between the two of them with something sharp, which I don't usually get away from myself, I can take the one offset that this little runner was making, put my fingers in where I just cut. This is that best soil that I was telling you about. It's from Northwest Detroit, beautiful older neighborhood with soil that never got messed up when they 
I get a separate plant with its own roots, which I just mashed all together when I pulled it out of there. And another plant, and another plant, you name it. I've got lots of plants out of this foam flower, which will go out into the garden and become a new ground cover for us. Vanna White of Gardening Studios here. Thank you, The Steve. best paper to use, New York Times. Yes, yay, New York Times. They make such great paper. It's thick enough to use for smothering. We're not it's necessarily talking paper. about reading. Yeah. Um, Other plants that run, and I'm just doing runners first here, are things like the ground cover sedums. So this is sedum angelina. And if it looks like odd sedum angelina, it's because it's playing the game we call see who wins with the rug juniper next to it in the garden. So rug juniper, here the blue green foliage, and sedum, the yellow, um, the person whose garden this came from, doesn't like it that they mix it up. We love it that they mix it up. We think it's a pretty effect and it makes sure that something is always covering things. But it also happened to be something very good to show you how woody plants do what they do. So the juniper has been laying down there and where it made good contact with the soil here, the juniper has begun to grow roots. And so this is a division and any woody plant um, can do this. Pines and spruces are not likely to, but arborvitaes, junipers, tall cypresses, where the stem gets injured and lays down, they can make new roots. Take the juniper out of there. And with sedums, every place that they lay down, they are layering and running. So there are roots hanging off of here, and every single one of these pieces can be put by itself. And you don't even have to plant them carefully. Somebody <laughs> asked me on one of the sedum acres, sedum, um, Angelina is one of the sedum acres. She said, well, how do I make more of this? I said, just throw it, just throw it down, just throw it where you want it to be and they will root because there's enough moisture in this succulent stem to keep them going. So um, anybody who has sedum Angelina, another patented plant, I'm pretty sure, Anybody who has sedum angelina has in their hand right here enough sedum to cover many square yards of ground in no time at all. Um, so within three years. Yeah, so I can divide it into a piece. Get that juniper out of there. Lots of little bitty baby junipers. I can divide it into pieces that are about this big, like they were for uh, my head is cut off, just I'm not sure if that makes a difference to you. See. Well, I, um, I thought it was more important to see Probably what is. you're doing. You your can head. divide it into pieces like this, or you can divide it into smaller pieces if you want it to go further. Doesn't matter. Um, the plant is going to grow either way. I like to do fast. I'll get rid of the juniper because I have enough brown color juniper right now. Still working on running roots here. Irises are running roots. Um, the foam flower that I showed you and the uh, sedum that we just looked at are running uh, on the surface, across the surface. And they are running from a kind of a modified stem that gets its own roots. This is a rhizome an iris, and this is, this is an iris polita. Uh, so it, it's not the same species. Some people think it's not the same species as the bearded iris, but it acts exactly the same way. Um, the stem, these are leaves up here. The stem is down there. The stem is actually running along the ground and forming new roots as it runs, just like the sedum is. Uh, it's doing the same thing that the sedum is. This piece can grow. Um, you're told in many books 
to divide to the size of this one that I just divided, that a Y-shaped piece is probably a good size piece that's gonna give you a good bloom and stabilize itself. That when next year this one has a flower stalk on it, weighing it down, it is more likely to stay in place if it's got something opposing it with some weight on it, holding it up. But no reason you can't divide to this size. Uh, zebra iris, as this variegated form of iris polita is, is called, is one of our favorite plants. And I will probably be dividing this one and spreading it out yes. um, over an area because the, the, the foliage is striking. It doesn't matter to us whether it blooms or not, it's for the foliage. And so we use a lot of it. This, uh, this type of plant, iris, uh, the bearded iris, and, and actually all rhizomatous or running root irises like this, we're told to divide in July. And the reason that they're, that uh, recommendation is being made is that there is an insect called iris borer. It's a moth. Uh, just about now, the moth has finished flying around and laying its eggs on everything that smells like iris, all iris family plants. And those eggs will stay on these leaves when they lay down. Next spring, the uh, caterpillars will emerge, follow the dead leaf, and as the new leaf is coming up, they eat the new leaf, and eventually they eat fast enough that they eat down into the root. And from the root, they then bore out in July, sometime in late July, and they pupate in the soil to come out as a moth. Well, if you divide in early July, every iris borer in the world is in the roots of the plant. It's not in the soil, it's not on the leaves, and so you can divide and find the squishy parts and get rid of them. Um, and it's good to get rid of iris borers because when they tunnel into the plant, they bring with them the uh, bacterial resting bodies of a rot that makes them go squishy, which is not a nice thing to do and doesn't make your plants bloom very well. Uh, while we're breaking for the next plant, I'm getting some requests. Can we go ahead and zoom that table in so it's really mostly just your hands? Uh, people are asking to be able to see better, so we'll sure. do a table scooch if possible. That's what I was wondering. I'll also uh, uh, note for anyone else uh, uh, curious that just because of the limitations of bandwidth, you might not get a terribly clear picture. So don't expect that it, it will be like super clear just because it's web hosting. Um, but we'll we'll zoom in on the hands and see if we can get closer there. Okay, let's get closer on the hands. <laughs> Okay, good. Just hands. Got it? Back up. You uh, back well, no, tilt the screen down just a little bit more, Padre. There you go. Yeah, let's try that. All right, still working on running roots here um, and running on the surface. We have Coreopsis. This is the thread leaf Coreopsis. This cluster is running. You can see the rhizome here running and making its own roots as it goes along. So every little piece can become its own plant. I took this piece out, although threadleaf coreopsis can stay for quite a long time, I took this piece out because it was running into another plant and I wanted to sort the two of them out. I can now replant individual pieces, one here, one here, and they will fill um, very quickly and this stem will grow thicker and hold more flowers than it would in a tight group. So I divided a hybrid threadleaf coreopsis one called Mercury Rising, last fall. It got a little wilty in the middle here overnight. I'm gonna take off the wilty part just so we can see what I need you to see. There. This was a little tiny piece like I just had in my hand here. Last fall, I took one thread leaf cor coreopsis mercury rising and it was a clump about um, about as big as half this paper around and I wanted it to cover a big area so I divided it all into small pieces about like this about like this thread leaf coreopsis that's next to it here this is what they look like now after a year and this all of this that you see up here is what came from it and the vigor of this thick stem created a plant that bloomed all, it bloomed, started blooming in July and it's still blooming now. Um, overnight while I had this out of the ground, the flowers have shriveled up, but they were still there. They were still right there. 
Um, and that's because the plant had more room to grow more roots. And it's planning next year. If you see here on the um, coming from the roots, here's next year's shoots. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. At least seven stems are going to be coming from the energy that these two stems have stored. So the younger I get the plant, the more that I give the plant room to grow, the younger it is, the more vigor it is, and the more ground it covers the better it's going to grow. So this one little plant that I divided up last fall in the newsletter that we sent out this week, we showed you a picture of it. I spread it out over a five foot by five foot area. So 25 square feet is totally covered with red blooms. Looks great. Actually, can I break in there because there's a, a really relevant question that R Renee was asking about that some of the, the uh, cuttings, the, the uh, division plants, they seem very small. Would you put them in a TLC location before you put them back in the, uh, in the main area? Sometimes, sometimes we do, um, sometimes we do uh, give plants, I feel funny not being able to talk to somebody. Sometimes we do give small divisions tender loving care. Um, we just put a little piece of variegated obedient plant into a space where I know that no other plant will grow over the top of it this fall or next spring um, and uh, where I can remember that it is. But I did it simply to give it room to grow, its own sun, its own light. Some people will um, take a, uh, an area and put in clean soil. Um, I did that once with a whole bunch of divisions of pussy's toes. Um, so I had clean soil, so I wasn't having any weeds coming up between them and set them all by themselves. But for the most part, I'm going to put the plant where I want it to grow and let it grow so that I don't disturb the roots again in the amount of time that I'm giving it to fill in the area. Great, thanks. Um, are you looking for recommendations for uh, uh, plants to divide or, or are you just going to kind of go through what you can? Sure, sure. All right, um, we've got... I'm working my way through the different types of roots here. I'm right Great. now working on... Japanese anemone, which if I'm putting it on the ground, is taller than I am. No, actually, it's just exactly as tall as I am with white flowers. This is Honoré and Jobert. And this particular anemone had run and was coming up in the middle of the turtle head next to it. So I told it yesterday, no, sorry, you can't do that, and brought it to you to show you what it's doing. It's growing offsets. So there is, here's an offset right here. I can simply snip between the two shoots, this shoot and this shoot, and I can get another plant. So I could cut right here. Or I can recognize that Japanese anemone grows by roots, its roots underground run and spread. I think you can see on here little white dots on the roots. Each one of those can come up and be a new stem. It won't usually come up and be a new stem until it gets out of the shade of the mother plant. They do not cooperate. Let me do this to them. Oh, that's the. Well, it broke off. Once they get out from in the shade of the mother plant, then that root comes up and that little white bud that wasn't growing until it got there turns upward and comes into another plant. So I, if I want more Japanese anemone, I can dig up a piece and divide it. I can take up a piece and I can crack apart these two pieces, or I can be nice to it and I can cut apart these two pieces. Knowing that each one is going to form its own roots from this part right here, or I can go to the side of the plant and dig down, put my hand down, and find what I know will be there, which is a root. that's turned itself upward. Now this is one of those plants, Japanese anemone, anemone cross hybrida. Wonderful plant, except that you have to know it's gonna run around like this. You have to know that it's gonna be crazy for you. Um, 
some of the varieties spread less vigorously than others. Some of the short dwarf ones now and the double forms um, spread less, but they are going to spread. Um, and you are often told you shouldn't divide them except in the spring. And that's because I think, um, growers tell us this, they sulk this time of year when I divide those now when they're in leaf, they will make you feel terrible. They will go into the ground in the new place that you put them in or into a pot and the leaves will hang and them. Oh, they're just, they, they, oh, they just look miserable and they make you feel miserable. They don't die. The next growing season, up comes the stem, up comes the new shoot. So um, you're told to divide them in the spring, probably mostly because you get the best response then. But you can divide them whenever you need to get a piece of them. Okay, so recommendations. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, we're getting lots of recommendations. Can I clarify that uh, the threadleaf coreopsis would stand in for any coreopsis? Uh, no. Okay. Threadleaf coreopsis is a runner. One second here. The tick seed coreopsis. Tick seed coreopsis, this one right here, is an, it forms offsets. It's not running. So each plant is at its base, making more plants that can be um, pulled away from the, uh, the mother plant. I've just broken it away from the little piece that connected them, and each piece is its own. So the thread leaf coreopsis is a runner, and the uh, tick seed coreopsis forms offsets. So I divided and I just broke right there, they were connected. That's where the offset set itself to the side and grew its own roots. So from this young piece here, I can make four pieces and I can get rid of this old piece in the middle. See the piece in the middle? That was probably the original plant. Is not made, it probably would grow. Probably if I planted this someplace, it would grow, but you can see that the stem itself is brown. There is some dark matter on here that's not dirt. And that's because it's been around for a while and it's probably been infected by one or the other things that can, that can affect this plant. Okay, Coryopsis is different then. Great, I see that's Crocosmia there. We had a couple of requests for Crocosmia. Sure, Crocosmia is, uh, is I, it's, I love it. The first time I dug up Crocosmia, I said, this is the coolest root ever. Um, this is a runner that forms corms. Corms are enlarged base of the stem. Crocuses do this, some other plants make corms, gladiolas do this. So the base of the stem enlarged and makes this storage organ down here that's going to make next year's roots. This year's corm on the bottom has been depleted as the new one forms. But not only does it make a new corm at the base of the, of the uh, plant, but it has these running roots that make their own little cormlet off to the side. And every single one of those is a new Crocosmia. I can break them apart and say, I will take this one and plant it by itself. I will plant these and plant it by itself. This is Crocosmia lucifer. Lucifer was named before the plant patent time, so I don't believe it's a patented plant. I don't think we're um, breaking anybody's heart here doing this or breaking any banks. <laughs> they don't need our dime. Um, now let's not, let's not say that. Okay, so every one of those is its own plant. Crocosmia. And sometimes they'll reach out quite a ways. You can see the new, the new cormlet forming there on the outside edge. At least I think you can see the cormlet forming on the outside edge over here. Um, corm root. Last fall we took out a, uh, a Crocosmia that had been in the ground in a, um, a good rich soil for about eight years. And I think I spent an hour and a half, maybe longer than an hour and a half, digging out and chasing corms to try to make sure that in that area, which had been lovely with the Crocosmia in it for a long time, but we didn't want Crocosmia there anymore, did not erupt with Crocosmia this spring. So they can become quite a thick group of plants. Um, we also, let's, well, I'll see what you pull out next and then make a... We have what? Sorry? Um, we've had quite a few suggestions for Budlia. That's not Budlia, is it? No, it's not Budlia. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll set this one to the side. This is a 
uh, bleeding heart, and we'll show you Ble bleeding heart. Bleeding heart is on the list too, but there were more requests for Budlia, so either one. I'm going to move the bleeding heart to the side. And Stephen, can you give me the Budlia that's down there? Budlia. You're is, assuming I know which one is the Budlia. And you know which one is Budlia, for heaven's sake. I'm losing the paper. Okay, this is a butterfly bush that's growing in our front yard. It was last year a four inch pot. If you look here where the roots dip down, you can even see that that's how wide the pot was. Uh, this year, it was outside the door. I left one of the branches that came from with it, Steve. Um, so it's big this year. And this year, after watching it, I said, I don't want that color. That's not the color that I wanted to have out there. So it was, I'm gonna step back here. It was this big. I'm putting it on the floor next to me, and it is coming up to, can't do both things here, can't be on the plants and, oh, there we go. Um, so it's a very nice, big flower cluster, huge flower cluster, looks more like a hydrangea than a butterfly bush, but it's a, it's a, a lilac color, a lavender color, and not the concentrated uh, jewel tone color that I wanted to have out there. But a couple of neighbors have admired it. Ooh, that's so cool. Unfortunately, there's only one of them when I told them that it, the, one of the bushes. Um, so yes, can I divide it? If I look here on this nice woody plant, there is a seam. I think you can see it. I'm certain that I can see it. There's a seam right here because probably this was when it was made was two cuttings stuck into the pot together. So there's a place right there that I can put something in and, and uh, uh, take it apart. Uh, with woody plants, woody crowns, like hibiscus, butterfly bush, um, hydrangeas, uh, other shrub type plants, you can saw them apart. And that's what I'm working on here. Um, but what I did is I cheated earlier today. I sawed, can you see the cut that I've made through here? There's a cut that goes right through here and I cut through there and then I started to chisel my way through. I thought I would be able to do that before we started out um, working here but I'm chiseling my way through to separate this into this part of the plant which has its own roots and this part. I can also, um, um, I, I, I do want to say before I cut this apart too that I cut this down before I took it out because I didn't want to have to deal with those big branches while I was digging out these roots. To dig out these roots, I dug a trench all the way around the plant and then put my spade in into the trench and, and started popping loose so that I could get as much root as I could. I didn't want to deal with those branches. They're brittle, I couldn't tie them up. So I cut them down because I can cut butterfly bush down in the fall and I do anyway. This was cut to ground level. This was planted at this level. These were underground, these other parts right here. I left one piece up so that I could fling it around while I was showing it to you. But when I cut butterfly bush down, whether it's in the fall or in the spring, I cut it all the way down. It's going to grow from buds on the stem. You can see probably a couple of them right now. There's a bud right here, a bud right here, those are all going to grow, um, or all can grow. Um, and I don't want to have year by year more and more stems like this cluttering the base as I try to cut it down. I want to cut it all the way to the ground and let it come all the way up from below the ground. You don't have to cut it down. If you want to let it just grow from the branches the next spring and cut off whatever died, you can do that. I don't like to do that because it makes a bushier, hoarier, more tangled looking doesn't have plant. a structured look. Okay, I can also look and see that this one layered itself, that this branch right here, so I'm not going to right now go down on the floor and finish chiseling through the main part of the plant. It's taking over five minutes. Yeah, um, but you can see that this stem right here has made its own roots, and I can, once I've got that out of the ground, I can cut that one apart from the rest. Can you hold it steady for me, Steve? This is why we wanted to do this 
in real time in real life for you so that you could see that yes it does take a little doing to do this but it's not it's not rocket science and it's not impossible to do it's just that you need to get yourself into a place where you can reach with whatever tools you've got to do the work you need to do that's okay I could also use a saw on this, but again, that would take a while. There we go. Butterfly bush. So now, of the two neighbors who both wanted my butterfly bush if I was gonna dig it up, I now have an illegal piece. That's all mm -hmm. these butterfly bushes are. But that piece is going to grow and be easily this big the next year. I hope that answers the butterfly bush questions. Um, put it back in the ground anytime. Um, when you put it back in the ground, you can see some of the mess that happens when it was in too small a pot. You can see that this root is turned around itself. That can throw it, slow things down. If you've got a plant out of the ground and you can see that the roots are a mess and are tangled or are girdling each other and it's a woody plant, you can get rid of those. Would this grow, this piece right here? It might. It's close enough to the surface that it might have some buds on it. So it might grow, but most of the time, woody plants, the roots don't grow. They don't grow back from being left in the ground. All right, that's butterfly bush. I've got a, got a quick question uh, from Judith asking, uh, why decide to use the chisel instead of sawing all the way through? Is there a preference there? Um, the, uh, the bits of soil that are left in the root clump really make a saw work very, very hard. Um, they, uh, they get caught in the teeth and the, the teeth don't cut. So the chisel would get through more quickly. That's all that it would be to do it. So if you've got a sawzall and don't mind um, working a sawzall, fine. I don't like working my arm that much uh, when I know that I can do it another way. Bleeding heart. I left the stems on it so you can see where it's gone dormant. Bleeding heart, we're often, it's often recommended that you uh, divide bleeding heart right after it goes down rather than waiting until um, a month later or whatever in the fall. And that's because these eyes, you can see the eyes that are here. These eyes were tiny little things when the plant first went down. These are growing now. We call, it, we call it going dormant in the fall. The plants go dormant in the fall and they don't go dormant in the fall. They just change how they grow. So these are growing. And right now when I divide this, these buds are more, it more easily knocked off so I might lose a few buds when I divide it later in the year rather than earlier in the year. But no reason that you can't divide it now or any time. The first time that I seriously divided um, Bleeding Heart was when some workmen who'd been hired to put electric lines into the client's garden came after we cleaned up the garden in November. They came in December and they trenched through our garden and they just trenched through the garden and they just threw things right and left in all directions horrible. and i i felt so terrible i got there in march and here's all these beautiful big bleeding hearts have been picked up and and left on top of the ground all winter long and i went oh you poor things but i just took all the pieces looked at them saw the buds on them put them back in the ground and they all grew um, and you realized you know it doesn't matter if a plant wants to grow it will grow so a uh, bleeding heart is growing by offsets the same way a peony does this piece has set itself off from the rest, has its own roots, has its own buds, and the buds are the power, are the power, power plant. The buds are forming roots. These roots were formed by the buds that extended themselves this, this summer. These are one-year-old roots. Here are the new roots that will be next year's one-year-old roots. The most powerful thing you need to keep are buds. You don't have to worry about keeping all the rest of this. And the older part of the plant, so here where I broke it away, has discolored material on it, has the base of the stem is hollowed out, almost like a, a, a bad piece in a potato. It's always a good idea when you're dividing things to do what you can to get rid of the bad part of the plant, the parts that have begun to get some fungus or rot in them and keep just the good part of the plant. And I forgot to bring the bleach water out. Um, this would be a plant that uh, if you were dividing into very small pieces and you were concerned about not wanting to lose a single piece, 
put this into a, a bucket that's got a 10% bleach solution, which Steve has just gone to get, and swish it around for about a minute. Or you can use a dusting sulfur, a fungicide, and it's called flowers of sulfur or dusting sulfur, and you can dust that with a fungicide. But all you're going to do is, is mix it up. Yeah, and throw it in there. Yeah. So we have all over our house, we have uh, <coughs> containers that say 10% bleach solution, where I have put in one cup of bleach and nine cups of water, and we use that bleach solution to, to uh, sterilize tools that we're using, hands. or plants, hands. Uh, uh, this, and in this year, um, about everything. We're wiping everything down with bleach. So this bleeding heart can be divided by hand and just crack it away. Take away the parts that don't make sense to keep because they're the old parts. Clean it up. I just swished it around in the water. You can see that the oldest part of the stem here is hollow where fungus has gotten into it. That's not, that's gonna be a weaker part of the plant. Don't need to keep that part. People are af afraid to cut it because they think it's the biggest part of the plant. It's not, the biggest part is that shoot right there. Those shoots are what are, are gonna bring all of the growth this year. So take it off, plant that part. Take off that old stem. If you can get it off without hurting the bud. Without hurting the buds. And this is what growers are doing through the winter. You can see that the rot was extending itself, starting to extend itself down into the rest of the plant. Now, bleeding hearts do not have many problems with rot. You don't find them um, dying away on people. So I'm not too worried about this one. Every piece of these will grow. Okay. Take your pruners. Take my pruners and take your pruners. Oh. We also had uh, requests for uh, Baptisia remains a question and Colchicum if you're looking for recommendations. Okay, good. We'll get the Baptisia first. And I have just a little Baptisia. I don't know the time. Steve. It's uh, last I looked was 940 ish, 935. Okay. Okay, we have just a little Baptisia because I'll show you a picture if we can get our sharing screen back on here. Maybe we'll go upstairs for that, Steve. Because the big one takes an hour to get out of the ground. Here's how Baptisia grows. It's a, it's a woody root and it can be a very deep root. This one I broke off. This was going straight down. I broke this root off at 15 inches or so. It might have gone down two or three feet and as it gets older and older, it goes down further. I don't need all that root. I, all I need is this part up here. It will grow. So here's two Baptisias off of, a, off of a bigger cluster. As long as it's got buds, there are buds growing on the stem right there, and roots, it's going to grow. And uh, Baptisia is a member of the pea family. You can see the nodules here on the, on the roots. That's uh, what helps them fix nitrogen. The reason I dug this one up is that it was not growing well. And when I dug it up and saw it only had just a couple of nodules, I'm realizing there's not enough bacterial activity in that soil to really support this plant well. Now, it's, uh, Baptisia is one of the ones that says, oh, don't disturb it. You can disturb it. That's how they get plants like this to put in a pot and sell. They take, they take a long time to get bigger, and they can stay for 25 or 30 years in one place. So why would you disturb would it if you, you don't have to? If you don't. Uh, colchicum, a bulb, is blooming right now. So this cluster is blooming and looking beautiful. In fact, in the pot, in the uh, bucket where I had it, it's blooming beautifully. It is a cluster of bulbs that you can dig up and divide. In the spring, we can look at pictures in a little bit. In the spring, these bulbs are firmer. This time of year, this bulb, so I'm going to divide the colchicum, which is, it's making daughter bulbs, offset bulbs. The stem is the base of the bulb, and the base of the bulb is reaching out to its side and making a new daughter bulb. I can take side bulbs, take them in my hand, and separate them from the rest. 
Well, I wanted to show it to you with the flowers on it, but it looks like I'm not gonna be able to untangle the flowers to do that. There we go. So there's a perfectly good division. It is, um, I told you, we told you last week, don't buy squishy bulbs. It looks squishy on the outside here. That's because this cover, which was there all summer long, was on a plumper bulb. That bulb has been giving its starch to, to the, the flowering shoot. But the bulb itself, see it's kind of wrinkly looking there and you can see the shoot is coming, maybe you can see the shoot is coming out of the bottom of the bulb. Um, that is going to form a new bulb next spring as it sends up lots and lots and lots of roots. It's a perfectly good division. And so this lots clump- Lots and lots of foliage. Lots of, oh yes, lots and lots of foliage. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so this clump that was one bulb of colchicum, oh, I don't know. Three years. Three, four years ago is now one, two, three, Uh, it's holding on tight there. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's about 14 bulbs. And those can all be planted individually. And individually, they will grow more quickly than if they were left here where they all have to compete with each other. Now let's look at the time in real time. Back in my bucket. It is 941. Right. Um, yeah, I, think, I think we're going to uh, um, run. Steve, why don't you head upstairs? I'll take a question. You go upstairs and turn on the camera. The um, is, is there any any way that we could do a hellebore? I'm getting some agitation for hellebore oh, from a few people. Yes, we have pictures of hellebore, but while he's gone, yeah, we'll, go ahead. We'll do a hellebore. Hellebore, and this is a division of a hellebore. I cut right through it. I took a sharp spade into the hellebore, cut the leaves off, cut this down further later, um, but I left them up so you could see what's going on. I just took a sharp spade and cut right down into a big clump of hellebore and took out a, um, uh, a wedge of that hellebore. In it, I can see, see the white roots? The reason that we're taking this hellebore out is that there's grass growing in it. And so I wanted to buy it small enough that I can get all of that grass out of there um, for, before I put it back in someplace else. Hellebore forms offsets. Don't let anybody tell you you can't divide them. Hell it forms offsets just like a hosta, and just like a hosta, it can have a really thick, woody crown that's hard to get through. And so it is really a good idea to have a strong knife or a saw where you can divide off a piece so i've cut through that large white part right there that's the offset that's the piece that what connected mother and daughter plant the other little white parts here those are roots that had to be cut in order to get them apart those are useless roots at this point they're useless roots I'm putting it in a bucket of water. Put. What you can't see is that I've got a big bucket of water over here to the side. All of those roots can come out. I don't need those roots. They're not attached to anything. They're not going to grow on their own. I'm going to take those out of there. A lot of those roots belong to the parts of the plant that, that um, was that this was cut away from. But once I get those taken out of there, I'll be able to see and separate out that awful grass that was growing right through the crown. So thick, so sneaky grass is that it was growing right through between two offsets. And if I break that, it's still going to be in there, that grass. There's going to be a piece of root in there. So I'm going to work it out and pull that out of there. make sure I don't take any fellow travelers with me when I plant this into its new place. So there, everybody else out of the way. I now have a hellebore with, 
I could, I could divide it even further. You maybe see that I could take and divide away this piece. See, it's got its own crown there. So I've got a hellebore right here that's going to have at least one, two, three. There's a little bud right here. It's going to have at least three stems next year, and it's almost certainly big enough to bloom. So I can put that one by itself and this one by itself, or I could have planted the entire thing once I got the grass out of there. So that's our hellebore. So um, we have a bunch of plants. So I'm not used to working both the mouse and whatever. I'm going to take you to hellebore. Um, we don't have to divide hellebore at all. You can just let it go. Here's with the flower buds already on it. I'm dividing it in the spring. Flower bud is the uh, part that is kind of yellowy here. Sorry that my pointer is small on a different computer where we didn't make our pointer bigger. Um, here are the flower buds getting ready to come up. And there you can just cut through it. We've already cut through and, and we're moving it in the spring, taking away the old foliage. You don't have to divide them at all. They can stay for a long time. As long as you keep taking old foliage out, See the streaks on this foliage? They, uh, they get a fungus on them. And if I don't keep cutting those off in the spring and get rid of the discolored foliage, that gets into the crown and starts, starts uh, uh, up delaying the bloom and even killing the flowers on it. So uh, you, as long as you keep it clean, you can leave it in the ground for a long, long time. There's a division. And you can always, here's a big hellebore where you put in a fork. So I got the whole cluster out of the ground. I drive a fork through the cluster, then take a second fork and drive it through with my foot. I push it through the, through the, the cluster so the forks are back to back, and then push the forks apart to take it apart. I think that was that one I was doing for the uh, fine gardening guy. It's very interesting to work with somebody with a camera stuck in your face all day long. Okay, so. What we're doing here is, before we uh, look at any more of those pictures, I wanna make sure that we have actually talked about these things. You saw growing eyes or sections. Um, I think I showed you the center oldest part on a couple of plants. Look for that, get rid of it. Don't replant the center oldest part if you can help it. And when you're slicing the divide, the cleaner the cut you can make, whether it's a chisel, a saw, clippers, whatever it is, the cleaner the cut, it's better because the plant can seal over that more quickly. And you might wanna dust it with fungicide but if you're plant, replanting it right away, I don't think it's any big deal. And if it's in flower, you don't have to take the flowers off of it. The, that's something that's, the, I, I don't know quite where that came from, but it does not have to happen that way. Um, okay, so plants, that, those, those are plants that we can see if there are questions about them, but before we get to those, let's talk about replanting. Soaking it in water before you replant it can be a good idea, especially if like these, some of these plants have been sitting around for a week while I, gathered things for, to show you. Um, if you have to hold plants when you're dividing them, put them in a cool place. A garage floor is a great place. It's cool. Um, it can stay damp. You can, just, you can just spritz them down. And when you're putting, new, putting a plant into a new place, level the soil. If you're replanting it in the same place, level the soil first, add compost first when you put it back in. So um, taking out this geranium, and this is the perennial geranium that I'd recommend you use for that ground cover dry area, um, Renee or whoever who asked about that. If you took out this much plant matter, then you need that much compost added back to that area when you replant. Otherwise your ground is gonna settle and your plants are not gonna do as well. So if I take out this much material, all these daylilies, all that golden marguerite, I'm taking out all of that stuff that's behind me, all of that, then I gotta put back in two wheelbarrows of compost. It might look like it's high when you put it in, but put it in, bring it back up to level and then make a wide hole and spread the roots wide. The wide, as wide as the roots of a perennial go when you plant it, that's as wide as the plant's gonna go that year. So that day, daylily is gonna take up that much room. And that's what we meant for you to see and ask questions about, about the actual dividing. I will let those go for chat so we can get to a couple of, of questions that I don't think we've had yet. Um, so we leave chapter two, which is actually cutting things up. Mm -hmm. And I hope that you saw enough cutting up to get you out into your garden to cut your own things up. 
um, we will move on to our next chapter. <laughs>